Well, you don't have to listen to that song anymore because today is the last sermon in this series. But if you'll take out your bulletin insert, the white insert, those are your sermon notes for this morning. And we are finishing up today this sermon series on how to worship God. My goal has been in this series to help us as a congregation understand what the Bible has to say about worship so that we will grow and mature in our own worship of God. Worship of God is the most basic attitude and action of our Christian faith. Worship is our response of love to God for Him loving us first. And we understand that comes from the command, the first and greatest commandment, and that is our memory verse for this series. So I hope you have memorized it. It's Matthew 22, 37 and 38. If you haven't memorized it, it's on the screen as well, as, on, as well as on your notes. So let's say it together. Will you say it with me? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Matthew 22, 37 and 38. Awesome. Next Sunday, we'll start a new sermon series just on the idea of thanksgiving and how to be thankful. So we'll have a new memory verse next Sunday. So far in this series, we've looked at the biblical understanding of what worship is and what it is not. We've looked at biblical attitudes. And last week, we looked at biblical styles. So today, we finish up with part four, and that is developing personal preparation for worship. We've all heard and even quoted the saying, practice makes perfect. But we know that as human beings, we will never actually be perfect. Although my wife tells me I'm perfect all the time, you know, but I, that's okay. <laughs> but the truth is we'll never actually be perfect. However, when it comes to worship, we do know that practice will improve how we worship. And when it comes to worship here on Sunday, it will be improved only to the extreme that we practice worship in our home. Another way of saying it is that your worship of God here on Sunday will only be as meaningful as your worship of God in the privacy of your own home. Think about it. We are here one day a week in this room to worship. But yet we have six other days during the week we're not here to practice our worship. So what are we doing when we're at home during those six days? What are we doing to improve and enhance our worship here on Sunday? Are we practicing worship on a daily basis and how we love God and how we express our love to God? Are we loving God during the six days of the week, or are we just waiting till we come here on Sunday morning? There was one pastor who explained to his congregation that his preparation for sermons on Sunday and his preparation for worship on Sunday was done as he walked to church on Sunday morning. And the church had purchased and even built a parsonage for the pastor to live in right next door to the church. So his Sunday morning sermon and worship preparation was that short, brief walk from the parsonage to the church building. Now, when the congregation heard about that, heard about his brief preparation for Sunday mornings, they sold that parsonage and bought a new one 30 miles away. <laughs> a little bit longer walk, isn't it? But what about you? Are you preparing for worship each Sunday? One of the best ways to be prepared for what we do here on a Sunday morning is to practice your personal worship each day of the week before you get here. So with that in mind, I'm going to look at three specific ways to help you, to help all of us develop our personal worship at home and be better prepared for what we do here on Sunday morning. Look at your notes. Here's the first one. In order to develop personal worship, I must set aside a time and place each day to meet with God. The attitude here is one of personal discipline. Am I disciplined enough in my personal habits to spend time with God each and every day and having a time and a place for that? 
Jesus Christ, I think, is our best example in this. So I want to take a look at four scriptures from the Gospels that give us the example of Jesus and that personal time he spent with God. The first one is in Luke chapter 5, and you can follow along here on your notes. It's Luke 5, verse 16. It says, as often as possible, Jesus withdrew to out-of-the-way places for what? For prayer. So in this particular context, Jesus had just healed a man of leprosy. And when news began to spread like it did about Jesus is here, he's healing everybody. Of course, that attracted a big crowd. And what did Jesus do? He got away from the crowd to spend time praying to God his Father. A second example here in Mark's gospel, Mark 1 verse 35, it said very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he, where he prayed. So here again is an example of Jesus healing many people. If you look in that context of Mark 1, he was healing lots of people. They wanted to come and bring more people for him to heal. And it says he got away from the crowd. He went off to pray. A third example, this one's in Luke chapter 6. Verse 12, it said, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Now, in this particular case, it didn't involve healing, but Jesus got away for a whole night to spend time with prayer, to spend time in prayer with God. And the next morning, he went out and chose his 12 apostles out of all the followers. So he wanted to spend time praying and worshiping and loving God before choosing those apostles. And here's my favorite. Here's the fourth example. This is Matthew 14, 23. It said, after sending the people away, he went up to a mountain to pray by himself. And when evening came, he was there alone. This particular example is when Jesus fed over 5,000 people with what? Five loaves of bread and, and two fish, right? So he's got this big crowd of people. He's just worked a wonderful miracle. He's fed them and they're happy. But see, what does he do? He sends them away. Now, this passage is proof that Jesus was not a Southern Baptist. Because if, if I had been there and worked this great miracle and fed everybody, I would have taken an offering. <laughs> Any Southern Baptist worth the salt would have taken an offering after that, right? But no, Jesus sent them away. Why? So he could spend time with God his Father. So we see a pattern here in these verses regarding the life of Jesus, getting away from the crowd, getting away even from his own disciples and apostles so he could spend time with God in prayer. So he could spend time alone with God in prayer. And one of his habits here is going up to a mountain. He liked to go up on the mountain to pray. That was in two of those examples. So he liked to be in a place where he was uninterrupted, a place where it was quiet, a place that was solitary, it says, and he could spend time with God. If Jesus Christ had to get away from everybody and spend time with God, then who are you and I to neglect that same habit? We need this as well. In our modern day society, you and I are very good at scheduling our calendar to the max. Some of you may have a calendar on your phone. Some of you may have a hard copy of a calendar that you keep, like a journal. Some of you may have a calendar on your computer. I keep one on my computer. But we schedule activities with our immediate family and with our friends. We schedule family reunions far in advance. We schedule meetings at work or meetings with clients. We schedule time for the grocery store. <laughs> and some days it's really crowded, isn't it? We schedule appointments for the doctor and, unfortunately, for the dentist. We schedule time for weddings. We schedule time for vacations. At least once a week, many of you, maybe twice a week, sit down and you schedule time on your calendar for things that are important. But do we schedule time for God on a daily basis? Is our time with God a priority on our calendar or is it just a last minute substitute? Here's the truth. If you have not scheduled a time and a place to meet with God every day in your schedule or on your calendar, then most likely you're being faithful to your schedule. Did you catch that? If you haven't 
scheduled time for God, you're most likely being faithful to your schedule. If God is not on the schedule, then you're probably not meeting with him. However, if meeting with God is a priority, and it is on your calendar, if it is on your schedule, then most likely you're being faithful to your schedule. I want to encourage you today, if you do not currently have a practice, a habit of spending time with God every day and having a place, a specific place for that, I encourage you and challenge you to start doing that today. Put it down on your daily schedule. Pick a time and pick a place to meet with God every day. If you're a morning person, then pick the morning. If you're an evening night owl, then pick the evening time. For me personally, I'm a morning person, and thankfully my wife is a morning person. So between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. every day, that's when we get up and we spend time with God. I have in my bedroom, my place, it's a nice lazy boy recliner sitting in the bedroom, and that is my chair for prayer. My wife has a place out in the foyer there of our upstairs. It's a larger space. She has her rocking chair and books and everything she needs to spend time with God in prayer. I also use my laptop computer. I like using that as a prayer journal, writing things down for God and writing down my prayers. I also have on my laptop a laptop, uh, Bible software that I can use to read the Bible and study the Bible. But I want to encourage you, set aside time. Set aside a place to meet with God every day. Express your love and your devotion to Him. Worship Him daily. Then it will make a world of difference when you come here on Sunday morning and how you are worshiping God. Now look at a second way to develop your personal worship of God. Number two, in order to develop personal worship, I must exercise the variety of biblical elements of worship. Now last week, and we were looking at all the different styles of worship from the Bible, we read different passages, and I pointed out to you there are many different biblical elements of worship. Here's another passage. Let's look at this one. Psalm 98.4 says this. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Break out in praise and sing for joy. So some of the biblical elements we see here in Psalm 98 are shouting, and praising as well as singing for joy. And on your notes here, I've listed some more. We talked about these last week, but I wanted to list them out for you. These biblical elements that we find in Scripture, there is singing, there's praying, there's fasting, reading of the Scripture, clapping, dancing, shouting, raising hands. And then, of course, the opposite of all that, there is bowing, there is kneeling, there's lying prostrate, being still, being quiet. Then we have giving thanks meditating, playing instruments, confessing sin, and receiving forgiveness. All of these are elements of worship, biblical elements of worship that we can do here on Sunday morning, but also in the privacy of your home. You can worship God and love God using these elements. When my children were real little, I was always amazed at the variety of ways they would express their love to me. For example, sometimes they may make a craft or make something at school and, and, or in preschool and they would bring it home and present it to me and say, Dad, I love you. I made this for you. Sometimes they would draw out pictures or make a card for my birthday or for Christmas and, and put on there whatever and draw something neat and bring it to me. Sometimes they would just walk up in the middle of the day and say, Dad, I love you. At other times, my children would crawl up in my lap, maybe want me to read a story or something, and they would never say anything, but they'd give me a hug and I could understand how much they love me. And then the one that really touches my heart, my children would bring me chocolate. <laughs> now that they are grown up, they bring me brand new golf balls because they know how often I lose golf balls on the golf course. But think about your own children, your own grandchildren, your own relatives and friends, how many different ways they express love to you. And how blessed your life is that because it's a variety of ways that they express their love to you. Should we not do the same in expressing our love to God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind? That suggests variety, doesn't it? Don't get caught in such a rut that there's never any variety in the ways you express 
your love and devotion and worship to God. I challenge you today to add variety using these biblical elements in the way that you worship God in the privacy in your, of your own home. Nobody else is watching. Nobody else is looking at what you're doing. Add variety to how you worship God. In my own prayer journal that's on my laptop, I've intentionally put in variety so that I don't get into a rut. For example, in one section of my prayer journal, I have just different ways to praise God. And in that, I've, I've taken many of the Psalms and I've paraphrased them in my own words and I'll read through one of those Psalms and use it as a way to praise God. And a second idea, I have in my prayer journal all the names of God and all the names of Jesus and all the characteristics of Jesus and all the characteristics of God. And some days I'll read through those characteristics and spend that time praising God. And then when it comes to the music and the singing, many of you know that on a computer, you can type in an address, a web address, and use it as a hyperlink. So in my prayer journal, I have songs that are hyperlinks out to the web or out to YouTube, and I can click on one of those songs while I'm worshiping God, and I can sing along with it. So I've, I've intentionally put variety in my prayer journal so that every day I'm doing something different in the way I love God, the way I praise God, the way I worship God. So I challenge you and encourage you, don't wait till Sunday in order to give thanks, in order to clap, in order to sing, in order to pray, in order to kneel or bow. Don't wait till Sunday. Instead, take advantage of each day that you have to exercise all of these biblical elements that I've listed here in your personal worship of God. This will help you as you come here then on Sunday morning, adding more meaning to what we do on Sunday. Then one third idea, look at number three on the back of your notes. In order to develop personal worship, I must keep a journal of what I learn from God and share it with others. Have you ever considered that the Bible is a journal of what other people learned from God, they wrote it down, and they've shared it with others. The Bible is a journal of all that people learned from God, they wrote it down, and they shared it with others. What if they hadn't written it down? What if King David had not written down all of those beautiful songs that he developed while his pers personal time with God in singing and praising to God? What if Moses, while up on the mountain worshiping God, had not written down all the laws? What if John, the Apostle John, had not written down his vision while he was on the island of Patmos? Look at it with me. It's Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit... So what was he doing? He was having a personal time of worship, right? On the Lord's Day, on Sunday, I was worshiping in the Spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, read it with me, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? Write it down and share it with someone. Write it down and share it with someone. So John, you know, as a Christian, had been arrested. He was exiled to the island of Patmos by the Roman government. Here he's meeting with God. He's worshiping God. And God says, write down what you see. Write down what you hear. Share it with others. In fact, if you read through the book of Revelation, 12 times, 12 times John was told, write it down, write it down, write it down. Why? Because you and I can read it today and we can see and hear and read what happened. But what if John had not written it down? Then we would never know about the end times, would we? What if David had not written down his Psalms? There'd be a lot of character of God that we wouldn't understand. And what if Moses had not written down the laws when he was on the mountain worshiping God? If he had not written them down, then we would not understand a lot about morality in our society today. You know, in Israel, if you can picture in your mind a map of Israel, there is the Sea of Galilee, 
And flowing out of the Sea of Galilee, going south, is the Jordan River, where John the Baptist baptized people in his day and time and even baptized Jesus. And the Jordan River flows down and keeps going south, and it ends in a different sea called the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is currently shrinking. It's getting smaller and smaller right now. It's about 31 miles long and about nine miles wide at its widest point. It, but in times past, it has been much larger. The surface of the Dead Sea is 14,000 feet below sea level. Perhaps you've heard that before. However, which you may not remember, the Dead Sea has no outlet. All of that water coming into it, but it doesn't go anywhere. It remains in the Dead Sea. There is no outlet. And since there's no outlet for what it receives, we have, we, what it receives, we have appropriately named it the Dead Sea. The water eventually evaporates due to the heat and the atmosphere there. But think about it, as you and I worship God in our homes and God reveals himself to us and makes his ways known and he challenges us and he corrects us and he gives us direction and wisdom, he teaches us things. It's important that we write it down and that we share it with others. Because if we don't, if we don't have that outlet, what happens? We become stale and stagnant like the Dead Sea. So we need to write it down so we can remember it and then so we can share it with other people. This is what God taught me today. This is what I learned from God today and share that with other people. And when we do that, it's that give and take of sharing and hearing from others what they're learning from God that helps us to grow and mature in our own worship of God. As I said a moment ago, my wife and I are both morning people, which helps. We both get up at the same time, and we both go to our separate places and spend time with God in prayer. And some mornings I may finish before she does, and I don't really pay attention to the time. I just pay attention to what I'm doing. And when I'm finished, I'm finished. And so I'll go out into the foyer there of our upstairs, and I'll say, so tell me what you're learning. And she gives me that look like, shut up, I'm not done yet. And the same, she'll come to me if she finishes first. And I'll say, be quiet, I'm not done yet. But we kid each other and we do share with each other what we're learning. As I stand here each Sunday and as I teach Bible study on Wednesday night, I am sharing with you. This is my outlet of sharing with you what God has been teaching me. And sometimes some of you do that for me. And I learn from you. You come to me and share with me what you're learning. But I want to encourage you even more so today. Make sure you're writing down what you're learning every day from God whether it be in a prayer or some type of application or what he's showing you, what he's teaching you, write it down. Maybe you want to use a laptop or, or use a hard copy of a journal or something, but write it down and then look for opportunities to share that with your family and with your friends and especially those of us here at church. If you haven't been keeping a journal of your times with God, please start today. Start today. Start doing that. Get a notebook, get a computer, get something and write it down and share it with others. My invitation to you today from this sermon is develop your personal worship of God. And we've looked at some very specific and practical ways of doing that. As I stated earlier, our worship of God here on Sunday mornings will only be as meaningful as your personal worship of God in your home the other six days of the week. Our public worship is enhanced. Our public worship is improved by what you do in private worship. And then also, your private personal worship, as we come here, it needs affirmation, and it needs encouragement, and it needs interpretation by what we do in public worship. So both the practice of private worship and public worship are necessary, and I hope that you're doing both. Each Saturday afternoon, or sometimes Saturday evening, depending on my schedule, I come here to the sanctuary and I pray 
for Sunday morning. I pray for you. I pray for our Sunday school teachers. I pray for the music and all that's happening and all the leaders. I pray for what we're going to do on Sunday mornings. Sometimes as I come up here on Saturdays, I may walk around the sanctuary and pray. Sometimes I just sit down on the pew and pray. Sometimes I go over and sit at the piano and bang out a song and I'll sing to God. This is a habit that I began going back to my days in college. When I was in college, I started attending a church called McElwain Baptist Church. It happened to be the church where my wife grew up, and that's where I met her. But I was with some college students who took me to church there, and then they said, hey, let's go on Saturday nights and pray in the sanctuary for the worship on Sunday morning. So I began doing that in college. It became a very important habit of my life. And when I started dating Mim, that was our Saturday night date. I was a big spender. We would go to the church and we would pray. Now, fortunately, there was a Krispy Kreme Donuts in her neighborhood. So after we would spend time in the sanctuary of praying, as college students, we went to Krispy Kreme, right? We gave out and we took back in. However, I love coming here on Saturday nights and praying for our worship service, as well as for other things in our congregation. But I do that only after I've prepared everything else. I have been praying and spending time with God the six days of the week, and even on Sunday mornings I do the same. I do it every morning, preparing for what God is going to do here. I prepare by working with a minister of music, whoever's here leading in worship, making sure we're ready for Sunday mornings. I spend time preparing a sermon, not just walk, and <laughs> not in the time I'm walking to church either. I spend time preparing for the sermon. I want to do everything I can to be prepared for what God is going to do here on Sunday mornings. And I'm encouraging you to do the same. Develop your personal worship of God, which will prepare you for what God is going to do here on a Sunday morning. So from these scriptures and from my own habit of life, I encourage you, develop your personal worship of God. And if you don't have that daily habit, start today. Start today. Go home, find a place in your house, make it your place of prayer with God and your place of worship every day. If you're already doing that, if you already have that habit, then do something different this week so that you're not getting into a rut. Try a different biblical element of worship that's listed here on the sheet on your notes there. Try something different. Do something different. Don't get into a rut of it. And please, share it with me. Share it with others what you're learning. I'd love to hear from you. Let's pray about it. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the opportunity we have each day to express our love and devotion and worship to you. Whether it's in the privacy of our home or here on Sunday morning or even while we're on vacation. Help us today, Lord, to make a renewed commitment to spending time with you every day so that our worship here on Sunday mornings will be improved and enhanced. And for those, Lord, who are here who who don't have this as a daily habit, I pray you would encourage them to start it even today. That as soon as they get home, they'll put it on their schedule to spend time with you every day. And help us to be faithful, Lord. Help us to learn and to grow, to become more like Jesus as we worship you daily. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.